Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We appreciate your presence. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour. That's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the hour coming up, we can be an inspiration to you. And the singing as well, of course, is the preached word of God. And we want to be a blessing to as many as possible. And if you call somebody on the phone and have them to tune in and get this hour, we'd appreciate it so very much. And if you have your Bible, turn with you please to the book of Luke chapter 14. I want to read some verses found there, then read a verse from Romans chapter 1. Luke chapter 14, I begin reading with verse 16, read through verse 24, and then in Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 20. I'm speaking on this subject, excuse me, please. And this tape is available, the message and the singing today will be available on cassette tape. And if you'd like to have the tape, it'll be tape number 145, 145. And then if you write in, and enclose a gift of $3 or more for each tape. We'll get it in the mail to you. Just request the tape number or by title. And if you're right in and uh, pray for us, I'll appreciate it. If you'd like to have a brochure on our proposed Holy Land tour, they're available. You need to be concerned about it. If you'd like to go, now's the time to get your name on the list and start working to that end. We're going to some wonderful places on our next tour, the Lord willing. It'll be tour number 12 for me, the Lord willing, if I go. I plan to go, as far as I know now. I've been there 11 times. That means I've had some experience in that area and be able to make it a blessing to you if you'd like to go. Maybe some of you like to send your pastor, your pastor and his wife. It'll be one of the greatest things you ever did for him. Now turn to Luke 14. I read that first of all. I heard the other day about this dear lady that had a almost new Cadillac for sale, one of the most expensive Cadillac automobiles. And she advertised it for sale and for sale for $10. Of course, when the people saw the ad, they said, well, there has to be a mistake. Nobody's going to sell a practically new, most expensive Cadillac automobile for $10. Nobody bothered about calling about it except one man. And so he called the lady. He said, dear lady, I noticed you have her Cadillac for sale for $10. She said, that's right. He said, well, I'll be right over to see it. And he went over to see the Cadillac, his most beautiful. He said, I'd like to try it out. And he, she gave him the keys. He drove it around the block, and it really purred like a kitten. A beautiful, fine, clean automobile. He said, now, lady, you mean you said in me this car for $10? She said, that's exactly right. So she signed the papers and he gave her $10. He said, lady, before I leave, uh, my curiosity is killing me. I want to know why you're selling this beautiful Cadillac for $10. She said, well, a few weeks ago, my husband ran off with the secretary. I received a letter from him yesterday. He said, sell my automobile and send me the money at once. All right. Luke chapter 14, beginning with verse uh, uh, 16. Then he said unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I bought a piece of ground, I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. Another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as I has commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out of the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. My house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste 
of my supper. I'm reading one verse of scripture from the book of Romans chapter 1 and it's verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The Bible said they are without excuse. Speaking on the subject, excuse me please. We know excuses are as old as the hills. No doubt about that. Old as the hills because they had the beginning back with Adam in the garden. Whenever he blamed what he did on his wife. And she in turn blamed what she did on the serpent. And so from that time until now, excuses have been made. And you could write a book. I could write a book on the excuses that's been given me as to why people won't get right with God. As to why they won't come to church. As to why they won't do certain things. You get all kind of excuses today about the matter of serving God. Like the man, someone came to him to borrow a rope. He got tired loading out his uh, ropes and so forth. And, and he said to the man, said, I'm going to need my rope. I'm going to tie up milk with it. That man said, you mean to tell me you're going to tie up uh, your milk with a rope? He said, yes. He said, never heard tell of that before. He said, well, one excuse is about as good as another. And so that's the way it goes. No matter what kind of excuse you make, one is about as good as the other. Like the man some time ago said, Preach Edwards, the reason I don't come to Northside is because I just can't make it up those steps out there on the front. Now you people here at Northside, you know we don't have step number one out there. And yet if that's the reason he didn't come because of getting up those steps out there in front of the church. Now that's pretty much an excuse, isn't it? Now we're going to talk about the excuses. Excuse me, please. And then number one, we find here the supper, a beautiful type of salvation in verse 16. Then said he unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many. Here is a man, a man in authority, a man with great influence, a man with power, that made a great supper. And he invited a lot of people. Now the supper here is a type of salvation and this is typical of the Holy Spirit using God's service to invite people to come and taste and see that the Lord is good. And John chapter 6 verses 51 and 54. Jesus said I am the living bread which cometh down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give him is my flesh which I shall give for the life of the world. He said whosoever eateth is my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. I will raise him up at the last day. And so whenever you receive Christ you eat of Christ according to the Bible. In Psalms chapter 34 and verse 8 it said, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. Now this man made a great supper and the Bible said he bade many. It takes time for that. It takes our expense of money to uh, fix a great supper. And so here is a man that made a great supper and bade many. Now whenever you fix for someone to come and eat with you, you can very easily be offended if they don't show up. Many years ago, I know a pastor that he was to go out that day for lunch and he had warned his people. He said, when you invite me out on the Lord's day, don't lay out of church. We can wait until you fix the meal after we get to your home. I don't want anyone staying out of church to fix for the preacher. If you did, I'd feel like I'm guilty of keeping you out of the house of God and I just don't want you to do it. Don't invite me out if you have to do that. One lady in the church, she thought, well, I'll invite him out anyway. And I'll just stay at home and fix up a good meal for him. And have it ready when the preacher gets here. But he didn't go. He didn't show up. And so that night she came to him. She was angry. She said, I went to all the trouble in the world to fix up a great meal and had it on the table. and Had it ready. Invited you to come to my house to eat and you didn't show up. He said, sister, you know I studied and prayed all the week. I worked hard on my message. I had a good table set this morning in the church to feed you from the word of God. And you didn't show up. Thank you, ma'am. And so we need to realize that we shouldn't let things come in to keep us from feeding upon God's wonderful word. We need it. You wouldn't go all the week without eating anything unless you were ill or 
on a special fast of some kind. You eat something probably every day to maintain your strength. And yet a lot of people will lay out of church on Sunday and think nothing about their spiritual welfare, not realizing they defeat upon the word of God. When their thirst is come ye to the waters, he that hath no money. Come ye by, eat ye, come by wine, and yet without money and without price. God said, you can come to my table, to my house, and feed upon the word of God without money, without price. You can come and hear the word of God. God doesn't put a price upon uh, his word, upon the ministry, the word of God. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him, and he with me. God said, if you'll let me in, if you'll let me into your heart, then we can fellowship together and sup around the table. See, if God comes in, then you and the Lord can have sweet communion and fellowship together. But he's got to come in first of all. He said, I'm standing now at the door knocking. If you let me in, I'll come in. God said to Noah in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 1, after the ark was completed, God said, Noah, come on in. And Noah and his family came in. God said to Israel in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, God said, now come now. And let us reason together. Let us reason these things out. He said that to Israel. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Jesus said, come unto me all you labor and heavy laden and I'll give you rest. Now God is saying today to sinners that are laden and heavy laden. He said, come and I'll give you rest. I'll give you peace. I'll help you. No doubt there's some today listening to me out in the radio listening audience. You're greatly disturbed. Maybe you, you have the headache. Maybe you went out last night on a wild party. Maybe you did something you're ashamed of. And, and today, if you had your time to go over, you just wouldn't do it. And you'd like to have relief. You'd like to have peace. You'd like to have forgiveness. God can take care of that if you let him. God goes before to provide for us. God has everything ready. When God invites that sinner to come, God has already made provision for him. Everything is ready. Now before God made the birds, he made some beautiful trees in which they could fly from tree to tree and build their nest in them. Before God created the cattle, he made the green grass to grow so the grass would be on the earth when the cattle was created. When God Almighty uh, created Adam, he made food for him to eat before he made the man. God had the garden there provided for Adam and he created man and placed him in the garden, the fruit was already there. Now we know that before God sent the flood, back in the days of Noah, God made provision for Noah and his family. God said, build a boat because the rain is coming. And when the rain came, the boat was already built. God said to Israel and Egypt, now I'm going to send you some food down there. And God provided uh, uh, Joseph to go ahead ahead of time and uh, store up some food so Israel could go down into Egypt and there have food to eat. God provided that through Joseph when Joseph went into Egypt and was promoted to prime minister. Before we were born, Christ died for us. You may say, now preach Edward, you mean that Jesus died for me before I was born? He surely did. He died for you before you were ever born. In fact, Jesus died for you 2,000 years ago almost. And so whenever you were born, he had already died for you on the cross, paid the sin debt, made things possible that you could be saved so you wouldn't have any excuse. Had not Jesus had things already provided and prepared for you and fixed up, you might come up with some kind of excuse. But since he died for you back yonder almost 2,000 years ago, salvation already prepared for you, you have no excuse. If you die and go to hell, if you end up screaming in the regions of the damned, it'd be your own fault. God has everything ready for you to be saved. Number three, let's notice some of these excuses here that these people made. I read about here in the book of Luke. Excuse number one, he said, I bought a piece of ground and must needs go and see it. Now this man bought some ground and he said, now I'm going to see the ground that I purchased. Now, he didn't have good business sense at all. Now, had he had uh, good business of buying a trading sense, he'd have most certainly gone and checked out the ground before he ever bought it. 
Read one time about a man was high pressed in buying some land down in Florida. And the man high pressed him and told him, said, Now, brother, now you need to buy this land. It's real cheap and it's right next to the lake. And you'd really uh, enjoy this land. It's so next to the lake. You'd enjoy the lake and you ought to buy it. And he high pressured the man in buying the land. And then the man went down to see what he bought. He, and it was next to the lake, all right. It was underneath the lake. And so the man didn't lie to him. He said it's next to the lake. Now, he should have gone down and checked it out before he bought it. Now, this man here bought some ground before he ever looked at it. That's a silly thing to do. That's an excuse. He said, I bought a piece of ground. I must go check it out, sir. I appreciate you inviting me to the king's supper, but I won't be there because I have other business to take care of. There's like a lot of people today sitting out in the radio listening to others. They're not in God's house. They got other things they want to do. That's coming a reckoning day when God will deal with them about these things. Now, number two, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I must need go and prove them. Now, this man said, I bought five yoke of oxen. I'm going out at supper time and try them out, break them in. Now, that's a poor time to break in five yoke of oxen. It's not easy to break in one yoke of oxen. But a man would go out and break in five yoke of oxen at supper time, that's some pitiful excuse. And he said, excuse me because I need to go break in these oxen at supper time, and so I won't be there. And then the other man said, well, I married a wife. Therefore, I can't come. He went to the third man and said, You know, the king has yet provided a great banquet for everyone and sent me out to invite you to come and participate in the great supper. And the man said, Well, I'll tell you, I appreciate what the old king's done and nice of him to do that. But he said, uh, I married a wife and therefore I won't be able to come. I just have to excuse me. And so this man said he had to stay at home with his wife. Therefore, he couldn't come to the supper. Who would like to enjoy a good banquet any more than this man, a man's wife, a newlywed wife? She would enjoy going to a banquet and sitting down and eating it. I read one time about this man that carried his wife out to this social. And, and after they ate the meal, uh, he kept going back getting cake and ice cream. He went back four times. And on the fourth time he came back, his wife said to him, said, Aren't you ashamed to go and get ice cream and cake these four times like you have? He said, no, because I always told him I was getting it for you. Now, there's always a good excuse, you know. You can always pass the buck and pack it off on someone else. Like the little boy, he just saw the cookie jar up on the shelf, and, and he uh, wanted to get up there just, just to smell of them. He, he just, oh, he just could taste them. If he could just get up there. His mother told him time and time again not to get up in the cookie jar to leave him alone. And he just, temptation is too great. He got him a chair and he pulled up there. And, and about that time his mother came in and he had one in his mouth. And she said, didn't I tell you to stay away from that cookie jar? He said, yes, ma'am. Mama said, but what I was doing, I was just up here smelling of them. One of them got hung on my tooth. And so there's always an excuse to be made. Even little ones figure out some way to get around their duty and responsibility. And so this man had married a wife and therefore he couldn't come uh, to the supper. Now we see here that these excuses seem to be very foolish. Now here's a man here that bought ground and need to go see what he'd bought. Man had bought five yoke of oxen, he wanted to go break them in. A man had just married a wife and therefore he wouldn't be there because he was a newlywed and he could have carried her along. She'd have been glad to have gone to that great feast, I'm sure. But they put up some kind of excuse. I have known in my ministry, and I hope this never happens to anyone that's listening to me today, but I've known families that have little infants born into the family, and mother and daddy sit at home for weeks and months after the baby is born and use that baby as the excuse as why they don't go to the house of God. They say, well, you know, we have this small baby and we just can't go to the house of God and takes uh, them and maybe grandma and grandpa and Uncle John and Aunt Susie, all of them, attend to that baby uh, during church time at home. Now, that's pathetic. There may be some of you sitting out there in the radio listening audience. You use your children today as an excuse as to why you didn't go to the house of God. 
You know you should be at the post of duty. You know you ought to be there. But you blame it on your children. And they're precious and they're kind and you love them. You wouldn't want God to move that excuse out of the way, I'm sure. So wake up and do something about it and get to the house of God like you should on time. Now we find here then that uh, the one man said uh, he had bought the ground, another oxen, another married a wife. I'm going to tell you why these should have come. The first man should have come to the house of God because he was blessed with money to buy land. Now here's a man had a good fat pocketbook. And he had earned that money. The Bible says it's God that gives you money, a power to get wealth. This man was pretty well fixed financially. And he had money to buy land, so he had no time for God. Somebody said when you drop a check in the collection plate, God doesn't see the check as plainly as he sees a stub that's still in your bank book. Now we need to realize that God keeps a record. And he knows what we give. He knows if we don't give. He knows if we're able to give. He knows if we're not able to give. Now this man was well fixed financially and he should have been glad to go on and show his appreciation. Secondly, here's another man blessed with oxen. Now a lot of men in those days did not have one yoke of oxen, let alone five yoke of oxen. Now if a man had five yoke of oxen, that meant he was in business. He was in the farming business. I was in Turkey several years ago, one of our tours, and believe it or not, I saw in the same field, looked like about a 10-acre field out there, level field. I saw a man on a tractor plowing. I saw a man uh, uh, plowing, a, an, uh, uh, plowing a mule, and I saw a man plowing an ox. All three of them in the same field, one plowing with a tractor, another plowing with a mule, and the other plowing with an ox. And so there they were in that field. But back in those days, if you had five yoke of oxen, you were in business. And people today that's been blessed and forced enough to have a little business, they ought to by all means honor God. God is looking down upon you and your business, and God blesses you and your business, and you ought to respect and honor God for it. That's a good way to keep your business on the up and up and see it grow and prosper. Now you dishonor God, have no respect for God, show God no appreciation. God might just forget about you and your little business, and you might fold it up one of these days. Now remember people that have business and able to get into business, have the knowledge, have the means to do so, ought to put God first in their lives. Some of the most wealthiest men in America are millionaires because they honored God with what God gave them. And God honored them and God blessed them in turn. And the other man, he said, now I've married a wife and I can't be there. Any man that marries a beautiful woman ought to appreciate her enough to take her to a good supper. Have you carried your wife out lately? If it's nothing but go out and get you a good old hot dog, it'd be pretty good once in a while. Take your wife out once in a while. She cooks and fixes those sandwiches there in your home and provides meals for you. How long has it been since you've carried her out to some place to eat? You may say, preacher, we don't have the money. Well, if you don't have the money, God knows that. But this woman here, could have gone to that supper. She was invited to that supper and her husband wouldn't take her. A lot of good women's been invited out to places where they could eat and meet with friends, but the old tight water husband grumbling and growl about it and sit at home and gripe, afraid he's going to have to spend a dime. He'd rather sit around and sleep and watch TV than to carry his wife out. That's a shame, isn't it? The Bible said, he that marrieth a woman uh, gets a wife gets a good thing. Now, if you got a good thing, you ought to appreciate that good thing and take her out to a good meal once in a while, and she'd enjoy it. But this man said, I married a wife. We won't be going out anymore. We'd like to come to the supper, but we're going to stop. I used to take her out to the hamburger place before we got married, but now since we got married, we won't be going buy any more hamburgers. We won't be going out to eat anymore. We're going to eat what we have here at home, and we're going to make ends meet in that respect. Now, you shouldn't do that. If you carried that gal out to the hamburger joint before you marry, you ought to take it back after you marry. Amen? amen. I got one amen out there. What's the matter with you other henpecked men back there? Can't you say amen once in a while? All right, so we find, he said then, that uh, this woman, she couldn't go because he used her as an excuse. Don't ever use your wife as an excuse for not serving God. God might just take her away from you. 
Be good to her. And God will bless you. Now, number four, the refusal was an insult to the master of the house. Verse 21. So the servant came and showed his Lord these things in the master of the house being angry. Well, you can understand why he was angry. He had gone to all of this trouble fixing this fine supper and these people come in all these excuses after they had been blessed in such manner that they ought to appreciate the fact of inviting him to the king. But they said no and it made the man of the house angry. In Psalms chapter 7 and verse 11, God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. Now if you're wicked... God's angry with you every day. The Bible tells us that. God is angry with the wicked every day. Now, we, they couldn't blame God. You can't blame God. They couldn't blame the king. He had everything ready. And so he refused. And you couldn't blame God for being angry with the wicked every day. When God's provided salvation and man won't take the advantage of it. Number five, notice a new invitation. The king said, all right, write them off. The man that bought the land, the man that bought the ox, the man that married the wife, write them off. Forget about them. They'll not ever get another chance to come to my banquet. Now I say, I want you to go out and get this class of people. Number one, you go out and get the poor. The man that's not able to buy land and oxen, go bring him in. He'll be glad to come. Not only that, he said, now you go and bring the main and the halt in. The man that's not strong enough physically to plow oxen. He's made, he's halt, he can't get around physically. He'll be glad to come. Then not only that, he said, you'll go invite the blind man in. The man that can't see a beautiful wife, go bring him in. He doesn't appreciate, this other man doesn't appreciate his beautiful and lovely wife. Go bring that blind man in. A man that can't see a lovely wife, he'll be glad to come. And so the king sent out the invitation to the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind and there they came in. They were glad to come in. Did you know heaven is going to be populated with the poor people? The poor people heard Jesus gladly. It's not going to be the upper crust, the upper class, and the rich, and the wealthy, the socialites, all that crowd that's going to populate heaven. is going to be the poor class of people. They're the ones that work and labor and support the gospel and hear the gospel freely. These others won't have it. And then I want to mention hurriedly some excuses we have today. Most every preacher can write a book on excuses. My, some of them, and I'll tell you what's true, some of them are really dealers. Now, some say, well, there's too many hypocrites in the church. I would go to church if there's too many hypocrites. And they rub shoulders with hypocrites every day. You may say, preacher, what is a hypocrite? A man that pretends something that he's not. I don't care what it be, religion or a businessman. A man pretends he's a doctor when he's not. He pretends uh, he can do certain things he don't. He's a hypocrite. And people rub shoulders with them every day on the job, in town, everywhere they go. But the church is one place they can't go because of hypocrites. Now, if that hypocrite stands between you and God, he's close to God than you are. So let that sink in a few minutes. Another says, well, I'll tell you, I would uh, uh, come but uh, get right with God, but I can't hold out. God didn't tell you to hold out. Nowhere in the Bible did God say for you to hold out. He said, you come unto me and cast your burden upon me and I'll hold you out. We're kept by the power of God. Somebody else says, well, I just don't feel like it. I, I would get saved, but I don't feel like it. A man a hundred years old, not too long ago, somebody tried to win him to God. said he didn't feel like it. For a hundred years, he hadn't felt like getting saved. He'll probably go to hell and that will feel like it. You don't get saved because you feel like it. You get saved because you know you need God and repent and get saved. Another man said, I'm just too busy. Talking to a man the other day and he came to church in his family a time or two and I called him and wanted to invite him back. He said, well, I'll tell you, preachers, I work six days a week and I need my rest on Sunday. Completely ignoring God. No time for God. He couldn't work one day a week if God didn't help him. If God didn't give him the strength. Work for himself six days and just too tired to honor God on Sunday. What a shame. Breathe God's good air. Eat God's bread. Enjoy God's shelter. God gives him power to get wealth. And no time for God on the Lord's day. That's sad and sad indeed. That's coming a time when you're going to need God. And he won't have any time for you. Let that sink in. Another man said, I'm just too bad. Well, that's what Jesus died for to save bad people. He didn't come to save good people. They that are sick need a physician, not they that are whole, Jesus said. 
And if you are bad, then you're the one God wants. And then another man says, I have plenty of time. Well, you know what you do or not. I preached to people at night, died before the sun came up the, the next day. I got on my knees one night, young and sitting in Greenville, South Carolina, in a prayer meeting. Begged a man to come to God, got out on my knees, tears in my eyes, and plead on him to come to God. He said, no, I don't feel like it. I'll come later. He died before the week is out and died without God as far as I know. You don't know when you're going out to meet God. Somebody said, well, you know, I've just waited too late. I've waited too late and therefore I can't get saved. You're not waiting too late if you want to be saved. If you want to be saved, you can be saved. These excuses are kind of silly. Like a farmer sat out there and let his barn fall in. There's leaks in it and rain on it. And, and somebody asked him, said, why didn't you... Uh, fix your barn up and just sit there and let the thing fall in he said well when it was dry weather he said it really didn't need to be fixed and when it was raining it was too wet to get up and try to fix it so I just kind of let it go and so somebody's always got a pretty good kind of excuse they think but all excuses are lies you weigh them out I mean you really look at them in the light of God in the Bible you find out they're lies now Adam started in the garden of Eden Eve uh, blamed the serpent, and they were both human beings. They could have done what they wanted to do, but they blamed on somebody else. Now notice finally, those who were bidden did not have another chance. Verse 24, For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. The man that bought the land never got another invitation. He missed out completely. The man that had bought the oxen never got another invitation. He missed it completely. The man that married the beautiful wife never got another invitation. He missed out completely. The master of the house said, none of these men will taste of my supper. None of these. How many times have people heard the gospel and said no, and God said, they'll never taste of my salvation. They may not realize that. They'll go on their merry way and die without God, not knowing the master of the house has already said, They'll never taste of my salvation. One of the most dangerous things you ever did is say no to God when the Spirit of God is pricking your heart and trying to get you to get saved. Some of you out in the radio listening to us right now, God is pricking your heart. The Spirit of God is shaking you up. You ought to get out on your knees, ask God to save you, believe in Christ because you might never be in this condition again. The Spirit of God may not even invite you anymore. Now is the time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Behold, now is accepted time. So if God is speaking, right now is the time to do something about excuses. Old as the hills. Excuse me, please. A lot of people say, and excuse themselves right into hell. Excuse me, I won't get saved today. Excuse me, Lord. I'll get saved when I'm a little old. Excuse me, Lord. i got other things to do. I don't have any time. Excuse me, Lord. I won't come today. And excuse themselves right into the flames of a burning hell. How terrible. Thank you. You've listened well. Stand to your feet. Our Father, I pray today you'll take the message and use it and speak to hearts and save somebody today. People that's made excuses, save them, our Father. Break down that excuse. Speak to their hearts and help them to turn to thee because we never know when it may be too late to get right with thee. Have you in this invitation, Father? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Debbie's playing for us on the organ. If she plays, I know not your heart, I know not your need. You know that. It's my responsibility to preach and hope and pray the Holy Spirit will use the message. That's as far as I can go. It's entirely left up to you as what you do about the invitation. That's your responsibility. Don't make any more excuses. Do something about it while she plays. If you want to get saved, come back to God and join the church or whatever. The way is open. You may come.
Bow your head with the